Because ain't Donna Ross the only one left for the Supremes? And Otis is the only one left of the original Temptations? Is snitching the fountain of you? Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky looky would be our Michelle Red Lip. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, the most salacious book we have ever read. Ever! Now, it's a Motown book, y'all, but hold on to your stockings because, baby, this book is everything. Deliver Us From Temptation, the tragic and shocking story of the Temptations and Motown by Tony Turner. Man, I, man. Y'all, if y'all hear something snorting in the background and moving around, little barks and squeaks and stuff like that, that's my puppy. David had been a drummer before replacing Al Bryant in the Temps. Originally, when AJ looked like he was fading out of the group, it was David's brother, Jimmy Ruffin, who was supposed to replace him. He had even been promised the job. Ninja what? Did y'all know that? I didn't know that. One night early on, after a couple of years of hard work and no hits in sight, the temps appeared in some small Michigan club. And David, without any warning, jumped up on the stage with them. He snatched Paul's mic and started singing and dancing, going down into the audience and driving the crowd completely wild. It was as if the temps had found the magic they needed to get them where they wanted to go. Suddenly, a very hurt Jimmy was no longer in the running to join the temps. His brother David was their man. Well, Jimmy Ruffin, that a teacher. You better get that shiz in writing with the bird of Gordy. Bird, bad bug bites ain't got time to coddle none of you ninjas. I like David Ruffin right away. He was someone a kid would like because when he talked to people one to one, he was very cool and made them feel important. When he spoke to me back when I was young, he would get himself down to my level so we could have face-to-face -face contact and he would talk to me as if I were an adult. Eddie Kendricks was like that too. Although not as talkative as David, on the other hand, Otis and Melvin, when I met them, didn't give me much attention. As I got to know them a bit better, I started to see that Melvin could be very sweet, very jovial, the kind of guy that wants to be liked. But Otis never warmed up. He seemed to always be looking around to check up on what everyone else was doing. And it didn't take me long to notice that nobody was doing anything in front of him that they wouldn't do in front of the boss, Barry Gordy. Otis would tell on his own mother. Eddie remarked one day, you say what? Very bad bug bites. From every book we've read, we know that Barry Gordy loves discord among the ranks. Because remember, the more that Diana Ross snitched on everybody and ran back, Barry flew over there eating too many cookies. You know she keep gaining all that weight. How we supposed to fit in the outfit? She over there eating all them muffins. Barry, Mary over there fucking that Mary Mary. Barry. You know, we know that Diana Ross was like that. To find out that Otis was the same way. Ooh. Ooh, 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 and ain't he the last one living? I guess all that snitching is the fountain of youth. Oh my God, cause ain't Donna Ross the only one left for the Supremes? And Otis is the only one left of the original Temptations? 
is snitching the fountain of youth? Otis would tell on his own mother. Eddie remarked one day, Paul, meanwhile, just seemed like a drunk to me. Of course, a lot of people were getting drunk at that picnic. Even I had stolen a sip. But Paul was the only one who got nasty drunk. He was rough and tough with anyone who got in his path. Eddie came across as mild-mannered and nice, but he didn't let people get to know him the way David did. It was only later that I found out Eddie was really a shy person, a country boy who'd been so scared to death during his early days in Detroit that he developed a reputation for being the reserved silent one. On stage, though, Eddie was the one that reached out to the crowd. David was just the opposite. As the performer, he was untouchable, but in real life, he was a fun guy, like a grown Dennis the Menace. The whole time we were at the picnic, he seemed to have a joke, a scheme, a plot up his sleeve. When Levi Stubbs of the Four Tops sat at a picnic table having a conversation with the Vandella, David would say, look at those two, them gossips. They've got their heads together. They must be talking about me. And he'd go over there and butt in and cause a whole confusion. Hmm. Well, I think David Ruffin thought that every song was about him. Well, God damn. How you just gonna be like, look at them niggas. What they talking about? I bet they over there talking about me. I'm about to break that shit up. Flo introduced me to everyone at the picnic as her godchild. If someone took you in at Motown, they always made you a sister, a cousin, an aunt, or something like that because this was family and you had to belong. But Flo didn't like the big sister routine. Honey, she say, Flo's nobody's big anything. She was fighting this supposed weight thing that Barry Gordy was always on her about. So she didn't like the word big. Godmother sounded more dignified. When Flo introduced me to David, he told me, well, I'm going to marry Flo one day. So if Flo is your godmother, then I'm going to have to be your godfather. I noticed that he was hanging around Flo a lot at that time, like he was trying to get close to her. Everyone at Motown seemed to be trying to get close to everyone else. But I guess Flo was only interested in being David's friend. He's just fooling, she said. I ain't hardly going to marry David. There couldn't be more than one star in that family, and I know it would have to be him. David, who was already married anyway, didn't pay her any mind. We don't need no church or anything like that. He said, I'm going to Christian you right here and now. And he poured some cognac right over my head. Child, that ain't your drunk uncle. Isn't it ashes to ashes and dust to dust or something like that, David asked? No, it most certainly is not, said Flo. That's for a funeral, fool. You're supposed to say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It stuck. David Ruffin had made himself my godfather and would remain so through all the years and changes and troubles to come. But back in 66, I had no idea how my changes and troubles there would be. Here was a family, my second family, and like them, I just thought it would always be this way. There would always be the Temptations. There would always be the Supremes, Martha and the Mandelas, the Marvelettes. Nobody would ever die. Nobody would ever break up. Everyone would stay together and live happily ever after. Looking back now, I can see that the seeds of discontent were already germinating in the summer of 1966. There were plenty of kids in the Detroit projects waiting to be made into stars. He'd proved his point when Murray Wells, after some years at Motown, a few big hits and high profile tours with the Beatles in England, decided to accept a very generous offer with 20th Century Fox Records that included a verbal promise of future movie contracts. Murray was still under contract to Barry at the time where Gordy had been pushing and polishing her with all his might as well as pampering her with $5,000 mink stoles. 
In the ensuing legal battle, Mary claimed that the Motown contract she had signed when she was still a minor at age 17, a contract that Motown told her she didn't even need to see because this was a question of trust and loyalty and you'll always be taken care of, became void when she turned 21 in 1964. Sound good to me. What I don't understand is... Were all, the, were all the Motown acts new additions? Bobby Brown, he exonerated Maurice Starr. Basically, he was like, Maurice Starr ain't had nothing to do with us not getting our money. That was all streetwise. And like I say, how them ninjas sleep at night knowing that you stealing money from them young kids? Right. Look at the Tommy Mozzarella sticks. Look at the Clive Davis. Look at the, uh, what is that, the streetwise. Who else? Dick Dyes Diddy. Who else? Chug Knights. How can you live with yourself when you know that you have stolen money from children, from the project? Like, I know they look at it as a come up, but God damn it, don't you sleep? Don't you sleep at night? Do you drive a red G-Wagon? Because you know the devil drives a red G-Wagon. That's probably the first car they buy with them children's money. Years and years later, Gordy admitted to having made a big mistake in his calculations concerning Mary. He said he should have held off releasing her big hit record, My Guy until after her 21st birthday, thereby keeping an ace in the hole. Instead, he ended up covering his losses by putting the big push behind the Supremes. Three girls who had been struggling so long, they'd been dubbed the no-hit Supremes. And then pointing out to everyone that as he had predicted, Murray Wells could not get a hit at Fox while the Supremes were riding high. Ooh, that very bad bug bites. Now Gordy was proving his point again with Martha Reeves, disloyalty to the company did not pay. No, child, that's the universe. You ain't God, very bad bugs bite. You ain't the universe. You ain't the person that, you know, say how the wind blows, how the sea waves. You know, you ain't that person, Barry Bud Bikes, but I think at that time, he really did have some kind of, um, I don't know, like God complex, you know, like the Oprah. Hmm. Y'all be like, why are you so mad at Oprah for? Because that bitch has a God complex, okay? She thinks she everybody's mom around here. You don't do right, I'm going to bring you on my show and I'm going to scold you. I mean, ain't nobody tell you to believe that man that told that blasphemy lie in that book. He, remember when he, she had that man to come to the Oprah Winfrey show? She was like, oh, I am so entranced into your book. Oh, I love the book. And then to come to find out the man was a whole fraud, made her look like an idiot. Then she brung the man back and cussed him out on the show. Fuck that buckle boots. I'm telling you, that's the reason why I don't get as many views as I supposed to. Martha, unlike most artists at Motown, had some previous music business experience. She started asking about where her money was going from massive hits like the 1963 heat wave. And Gordy answered by pushing her group into the background. You don't play with him because he will bite you. You do anything against him, you will suffer. And to me, that is Barry's biggest flaw. He made the business personal. You don't want to do what I say? Okay, you're going to stay under contract here in Motown and I'm going to make you sit in the corner. Eddie, get your ass over in the corner, Eddie. Martha, you too. Get your ass in the corner. And stay there. Sing to each other, goddammit, but I ain't gonna put an album out on you. And if I do, I'm damn sure I ain't gonna promote it. In time, a bitter Martha ended up with a little band for backup while Diana Ross and the Supremes had all of Gordy's attention and the best of everything. By 1966, Everyone in the company could see that the Supremes and the Temptations and the Four Tops were the first to get everything, while the rest of the Contours, the Spinners, the Marvelettes were constantly struggling to be recognized. Paul Williams had become bitter because he'd sung lead as founder of the Primes, but by 1966, the only solo he had left was Don't Look Back. Eddie and David had become the pivotal figures in The Temptations. Although a lot of people assumed that Eddie and Paul were the closest because they had come north together, at this point it was Eddie and David who were close. Paul was in the middle. As I got to know them better, it looked to me like a seesaw with two on one side and two on the other and one in the middle ready to go either way. 
But that wasn't the only reason for Paul's drinking. Apparently, he was tormented by the fact that he had fallen in love with Flo Ballard's cousin, Ninja What. Child, he had him fell in love with this girl named Winnie, and Winnie wasn't paying his ass no mind, okay? Because Paul was what? Married. Mary. Apparently, he was tormented by the fact that he had fallen in love with Flo Ballard's cousin, Winnie Brown, but he was still a married man. Now, I couldn't see even then why Paul should be so miserable about this. After all, lots of Motowners were married, and it didn't seem to stop them from doing whatever they wanted. I'd heard all about Diana Ross's affair with Smokey Robinson, who was married to Claudette, and then with Brian Holland, a relationship that came to an abrupt end when Brian's wife, Sharon, tried to beat her ass up, remember? Mary Wilson said that, that lady came down there to one of their events, and she was like, where that huzzy Diana at? Tell her I'm about to kick her ass. Now, Diana ain't no punk. Now, I don't know if she can fight, but I will give her credit because she ain't running from no fight. Hello, you know, Murray, scary, scary Murray is what they called her, right? But Flo had stepped in between of the wife and Diana Ross and was like, you ain't finna do nothing. Go on home, girl. Go head home. If it wasn't for Flo stepping in between those two, oh, Diana, she probably would have got cracked. Rumors were flying about who was going with whom. There was Mary Wilson and Duke. Abdul Fakir of the Four Tops. Then you had one Marvelette, Gladys Horton, with a contour, and another Marvelette, Wanda Young, with a miracle. One of the few Motown stars that was not surrounded by controversial chatter was Melvin Franklin, who was reputed to be very prudish. Otis, on the other hand, had quite a different reputation. Inside reports circulated about being so overly endowed that later when Otis was romancing Patti LaBelle, people would joke, I know why Miss Patty's hitting all them high notes tonight, baby. So let me pause right here. Is it me? But whenever you find a man that be horsish, okay? Horsish. That's all I'm going to say. They always look freaked out. Patty LaBelle yeah. said, you know, ain't had nothing to do with his pickle. It was because that nigga was trying to control me. And what you won't do is control me. I ain't gonna stop singing just because you Otis, okay? I got a whole group over here. I'm trying to do me over here. I can't stop my life because you Otis. Like, let's be honest, ladies. When you're dealing with somebody that's horse-ish, you don't want that every day. That's a surprise. You know what I'm saying? When you're dealing with somebody that is that gra gra gracious, okay, or grandiosis, you don't want that every day? You got to take that torture every day? No, don't nobody want that. That's a surprise. That's a gift. You know what I'm saying? That you bring out from time to time. You know, oh, I'm in a mood. I might want some of Otis today. You know, I feel like this today. But normally, a men listen up. We don't want to Otis because we don't want to take that pressure every day. The we joke took a turn for the worse when Mary Wilson became involved in a secret, passionate love affair with singer Tom Jones. That shit wasn't secret. Was, was Diane Ross there? And she was there. It wasn't no secret because you know D. Diana going to tell everything. That's why she's still alive. Snitching is the fountain of the youth. Act. Many said that they'd heard Tom Jones, like Otis, was extremely well endowed. And they would laughingly suggest that Motown officials would have been much happier had Mary found her passion and pleasure with Otis. However, Otis himself admits that he had a thing for Flo. You say what? You say what? I'm dead. I'm back alive. Did everybody at the Motown want a piece of the flow? Because you can't tell me that part of the reason why Barry Bedbug Bites was acting like that towards Flo was because he wanted some of Flo and Flo wouldn't give him none. Right. Oh, my life. Oh, my life. Oh, my life. 